Hey y'all, it's Andrew Couch here, and this is not an actual Tidy Tuesday video. Instead, I wanted to make a video where I rank um, common data visualizations. And I actually got this inspiration from doing some movie tier lists uh, with a friend of mine. And while I was doing it, I thought it'd be kind of fun to do it with the data visualizations. So uh, I created a little tier uh, list from the teamranker.com with just a bunch of uh, data visualizations. I actually got it from the R graph gallery um, in the chart types. So I figured like this is a pretty good um, kind of like array of, of uh, data visualizations that are pretty common. So I'm pretty bad with actual data visualization names. So I'm actually going to keep this on the side so I can kind of say the official name. And then I'm going to give my thoughts about the actual chart type and where I see it uh, being ranked as. Uh, as for the actual rankings, I think I'm going to kind of say it's like ranked by usefulness and effectiveness of a data data visualization. But as we know, most data visualizations are important and they all have, you know, their own use cases. So this is definitely not like a, an objective measurement where you shouldn't be using a certain type of data visualization. It's definitely a case by case basis. So unfortunately some of these charts are pretty, or some of these pictures are pretty small. So uh, I'll definitely try to uh, refer to this, the, my little, um, uh, chart table right here so we can kind of see in a little bit big, bigger format but um, I know these charts pretty well so we can first start up with this um, so right here we have like a little scatter plot um, let me see if we can find it right here so we have a little scatter plot again and I think the scatter plot is basically one of the best visualizations you can have and I would definitely rank it as S tier as is I think when you're looking at numerical data or just continuous data in general, you generally will make a scatter plot um, to do some type of pairwise um, relationship. So I think the scatter plot is just a great plot to use um, as is. Okay, so next is this, um, what is this like a uh, kind of a dependency or what, what kind of plot is it called? It's called a, uh, let's see here. It's a, uh, let's see, a, a dendogram. So it's called a dendogram and they look like this. And I kind of get a dendogram because they're, it's all about hierarchy data. You know, you have kind of like a tree and then you can see how these end nodes are related to this branch and it's related to the central branch in general. And although I think it is kind of useful when you're looking at like network analysis and stuff like that, I, I don't think it's a very common data visualization technique. And frankly, it's a little confusing to actually visualize. Um, so I'm gonna rank this actually kind of as like a C. I don't think it's really commonly used um, as is, uh, just cause there's a little bit better ways to do it. Um, for me, I definitely like a, like uh, a, a San uh, Sankey or Sanksy gram diagram right here, but I I'm gonna rank it right now at C um, just because I think in general, it's kind of hard to plot out and uh, in like ggplot so you have to go through other packages and also uh it's kind of confusing to actually look at um just from like a layman's term like if you're not really into data even when you see that it's a little confusing okay so this is the the next one is the heat map which i think heat maps are actually pretty underutilized um i think heat maps in general are pretty useful to look at um, especially when you're dealing with a lot of data so when I have a lot of data, generally I'll try to like bin it or group it. And that'll cause, that'll allow me to basically uh, um, see if there's any um, relationships that I want to look at. So a uh, heat map, let me bring up heat map. Heat maps are definitely pretty easy to make. Um, you just use GM tile and use the fill and you can add a lot of stuff to it. So not only is it useful from like, you know, using uh, two groups, but it's also kind of useful because you can condense it both on like a categorical variable, but also numerical variable. Additionally, if you're looking, if you're working with a lot of geospatial stuff, um, actually heat maps are pretty useful because uh, you kind of bend it in these uh, little things and you can actually see um, a lot of stuff going on. So I actually really like heat maps. Uh, I don't show them a lot just because uh, I think heat maps are kind of, uh, usually I'll do a, a, a scatter plot, but he maps in general, I'm gonna rank them as an A tier. Okay, so the next is, I believe like a, was it a, a bubble plot maybe? Like this thing right here. Um, 
we pull up a bubble plot. Um, okay. Oh, actually, it's maybe it's called a. Uh, let me find it. Um. Yeah, it's called I guess a circular. Let me remember, circular packing or circular tree map. So for me, I I generally enjoy um, these type of plots, like from a, a data journalist data uh, from a data journalistic standpoint. I think they're really compelling. Uh, you see them a lot on like the Economist and stuff like that. But in general, if you're doing like an EDA, I don't think they're very useful or they're for the amount of effort you put into creating these like um, these plots. Um, it, it does take a lot of effort to do it and you'd probably have to do it in like D3 or something like that. So in general, I think these are actually better than say this plot right here. But I, I, I wouldn't do it every day in my day-to-day -day, uh, EDAs. That being said, um, I think another variation of the plot is like a, a bee swarm plot, um, which are very cool. So I think I would probably rank this at least above um, um, this plot. So I do think these think plots are really cool. ggplot does allow, I guess, kind of like a GM jitter, but it's really not the same thing. Okay. So for this plot, which I believe is, what is it, like an area line chart, right? Or a stacked area line chart. And I, I, I really like these charts, uh, not only because it's a good way to compare multiple groups from like specifically like a time series basis, but it's pretty easy, especially when you do a lot of reordering with the actual colors to make a pretty good insight and kind of summarize all of your data into just one simple plot. So you kind of see an overall visual trend and you also see, you know, what uh, components are really driving an overall trend. So I'm actually gonna rank this as maybe B tier. Uh, you don't see them every day, at least in my work, but I I generally think these plots are really cool. Um, one variation that I actually like is the, um, like a stacked column chart, where it's basically like this, but instead of the um, the lines, it's actually like a column. But in general, these plots are, are very good and they're very compelling uh, to use when you're trying to get some type of insight from it. So these plots right here um, to my left is, I think called like a, a chord, a chord plot. Yeah, a chord diagram. And I I think chord diagrams, again, are one of those plots where you'd probably see like in The Economist or from a data journalistic standpoint. But when you're actually doing these types of plots, say you're doing an exploratory data analysis or just in data science in general, um, it's kind of hard to create. I do think these are very cool. Um, but you know, there's a lot, there's the use case for it is always about like networks and relationships. And I think that's really useful. And I think that if you sh were to create a, a, like an article about it, you can write a lot about, you know, how you can see these flows of relationships and their, you know, uh, degrees of freedom, uh, with their relationships between, you know, multiple groups. But if you have this plot, say like in a presentation to like, you know, stakeholder business stakeholders. It, it takes a lot of time to kind of figure out the so what of, of this plot, right? Even when I'm looking at this, I think this is from um, like the Gapminder package maybe or something like that. But it, again, it's something where, yeah, yeah, we can see South Asia and West Asia. There's something connected to it, but I don't really know what to really get out of it from like the other, other relationships, right? Oh, so through migration. So I think that's kind of interesting, but again, it's something where uh, it takes a lot of time to look at, and obviously you can see how the arrows can show those relationships with it with each other. But again, it's it's a little confusing, and you wouldn't want to do it every day, or you wouldn't like create that. Um, you couldn't create that visualization pretty very fast, um, at least in my opinion. So again, I'm going to probably rank this a little bit above this, um, maybe maybe below uh, the bubble plot, the this chart or the circular tree chart. Um, so you may notice right here for this next plot, we have two of the same scatter plots. This scatter plot or one of these scatter plots is actually like a, a uh, an animated scatter plot. So one of the famous um, visualizations using animation is like, I think like the gap minder of like um, life expectancy or mortality rates. And it shows how the trend of all these countries changing throughout time and how we as an entire society has have uh, lowered our mortality rates. And, and it's very interesting it's very compelling and it's a really good story and good presentation, but animated charts just are not good. 
Uh, I, I really don't think animated charts have a place in a lot of like data science workflows. Um, it's mostly to do one centered presentation. And even that, uh, there, there are a little bit better ways to do it. One way to do it is m mostly kind of like a, uh, a, a basic scatter plot and just have A and B and have like a connected segment. And you can see how like, hey, this, this, this point went to here in 10 years. Um, and that makes it a little bit easier, especially when you have, you know, a lot of frames or a lot of animation time in it, where like if someone stops looking at it and after 10 seconds, you kind of lose your train of thought, you have to go back and look at it again. And it's not the most, the best way to actually look at and gain, gain some insight. But when it works, it works very well. Um, so that just because it's like a D tier doesn't mean it's a bad visualization. It's just, it's really hard to pull off, especially in a data science workflow. So here is your your simple like line or time series chart, I think. Um, ooh, I actually have two of these. And I, for me, obviously, you're just going to put it on the, the S tier. Like any type of relation charts, you know, these charts are simple. Uh, they're simple. They get they're straight to the point. You can visualize an overall trend and seasonal, uh, seasonal patterns. It's a solid chart. Uh, I don't think there's much to really discuss about that. Um, I will say, I think a problem with a lot of line charts is there's a lot of noise and a lot of uh, uh, a grid line stuff like that, which kind of takes away from it. One thing I guess I will all say about uh, good line charts is to be um, aware of your scale of the Y axis. So sometimes people do like a log on the axis. Sometimes people won't start at zero. They'll start at some other axis, uh, some other number. And I think kind of making sure that you, you tell whatever viewer is, is looking at the chart to like understand the scale uh, so that he or she won't be confused. Okay, so now we have the actual bar chart. And for me, my the bar charts are my favorite chart in general. So I, I would consider it the best chart. Um, just cause like I, I, you, you deal a lot with, you know, categorical variables and you, you generally do a lot of counting. For me, you know, when you think about data science, you think about complex neural networks, you know, crazy, Bayesian analysis, um, you know, uh, a lot of like rigorous statistics, but a lot of it is just doing simple counts and simple counts can give you a lot of insight towards your own data set for modeling, towards insight, you know, towards growth and what's driving things. So in general, like uh, column charts or bar charts are great. For me personally, I prefer the, the flipped column uh, bar chart where the bars are going horizontal instead of vertical just because you can stick your access names a little bit longer. Um, but again, uh, when you don't have that many uh, things, you know, the, the classical bar chart is, is great. So this chart right here is a 3D chart. Uh, let me see if I can grab an example from my little uh, reference. So let's see here. It's like, I guess, yeah, 3D chart right here. I'm actually gonna do that. I think it's just better for me to search it uh, whenever I need it. So, so we have a 3D chart, and 3D charts like this are terrible. The, you need to have three charts that, you know, have a reason to be a 3D chart. For me, right here, this is just this would just be a, a bar chart, right? Even though it's a pie chart, it should be a bar chart because there's no, the the scale or the the dimensions don't mean anything right here. But for this right here, where you're doing like you know, maybe like a cluster analysis and you want to see a lot of interactions. I think a 3D chart is actually pretty useful, um, especially when you're dealing with um, surfaces too, with like geospatial stuff. And just in general, when you do, are trying to do an EDA with clustering, I think 3D charts are actually very useful. Um, I don't want to use them too much because I use I just do a bunch of pairwise um, charts, but sometimes uh, I'll do a 3D chart and those are always very interesting to see. So I think in general, they're pretty good. Uh, I'm going to put it right there. Okay. Um, so this chart right here is, I think, called like a, what is it, a, a spider chart? Um, let me see where, it, where it's called, what it's actually called. Um, yeah, a spider or a radar chart. Um, in general, I think spider charts or radar charts are, are interesting. Um, and I think a lot of times you could say this could just be a, a bar chart, right? Because it, it's just categories and their values. Um, a lot of times I would say is that sometimes you want to compare multiple groups by multiple categories. 
um, and having a bunch of spider charts like this or that um, is actually pretty cool. Um, I think for dashboards, it's pretty cool to have just because it, it looks a little bit more fresher um, and you can store a lot more data, um, I guess like per square inch of information uh, with, with a radar chart. So I think you see a lot of radar charts in like sports when you're showing like, you know, in baseball, like attributes of a player and or attributes of a teams and you're trying to compare the teams. Uh, so I think radar charts are pretty good, actually. I think they're pretty underrated. They're very hard to create in ggplot, but I still think um, they have a lot of their use cases. So I'm actually going to put this kind of on the bottom C just because, you know, you're not going to make a lot of them uh, in, your, in your in analysis. But when you do need to do it, radar charts are pretty much perfect. Uh, so nothing too, uh, nothing really too negative about radar charts. So this chart right here is called a lollipop chart. And I used to be a pretty big fan of, of lollipop charts because uh, from a data visualization standpoint, you know, they take a lot of, I guess the, um, it, it prevents, it, it, it solves a lot of issues with a calm chart where when you have a lot of groups, it can kind of be a lot uh, of information to take in. So when you have a lollipop chart, it's, you can have more columns basically. And it won't be as distracting for a, a reader or audience. Additionally, you, since you have the little point or the little like, uh, I don't know, the end of the lollipop, you can actually add some more data to it, which can make it pretty useful. So you kind of have a column chart and you can also add a little bit more to the column chart. Um, so the flip to lolly or the, the flip to lolly is pretty good. Um, a variation of it is the, the, the dumbbell plot. We essentially have two lollipops um, going on both ends. And I think those are the dumbbell plots are really good, obviously for comparing things among multiple groups. So if you're doing like ANOVAs and stuff like that, uh, I think lollipop charts are, are very, uh, lollipop or dumbbell charts are, are really good, um, use of data visualization and it's something you really can't do with a bar chart, um, very well. So I, I, I'm a huge fan of, uh, lollipop charts. I actually might put it above the heat map. So just for now, <laughs> I'm, I'm probably going to go by here. I go through here again and maybe do a little bit of rearranging and talking about why, but I think right now, uh, lollipop chart is, is definitely an A tier chart. Okay. Um, so this chart right here, um, I need to figure out what it's called. It's, I guess it's called a circular bar plot. Um, I, I don't like these at all. I think they look cool. So again, very useful for data visualization but it's just needlessly messy. Um, like it's kind of cool how we have like different subgroups, right? Where D, A, A, B, C, D among these, and you can kind of see it right here, but it's kind of hard to compare like Mr. 11 and group B versus, you know, group C's Mr. 48. Like how is this one bigger? You, you do a lot of um, um, searching. And I think this is very cool for maybe like a, a cover of some data journalistic, data journalism um magazine but from just from a usability standpoint it's it's way more style over function um i think this is probably the worst plot to use i don't think there's any use i don't think there's any reason why you would want to do a circular bar chart over like a faceted bar chart unless if it's pure off of aesthetics so um yeah not a big fan of it um i i i don't, I don't think it's a very useful chart in general um, the donut chart. So I, 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 there's a lot of, uh, of discussions about, you know, in general, if you're into data visualization, you know, bar, uh, uh, pie charts are the worst bar chart. Pie charts are terrible. Uh, they're bad for comparing things. The only time a pie chart is kind of useful is when you have like one large group with like two other small groups, but in general, a, a pie chart can be a bar chart. That being said, I think donut charts are a little bit better than pie charts, but just only slightly. Um, I don't think they're very good. I, I do think they look cool on on dashboards, but they're not. They're they're still. I, I I'm not really a fan of them. I'm gonna put them basically below the animated charts because sometimes you want a little bit more visual. Uh, a variety you know you can't just have you can i mean i, I would actually prefer a, a dashboard that's just all bar charts but sometimes you know you might want to do 
maybe, maybe like especially in like finance you know maybe put like a, a donut chart right there uh and and that that's fine you know it, it's it's nothing that i'm gonna get really angry about but you know i think most people would rather just have a bar chart um but you know vps probably like it <laughs> so with the pie chart i've already kind of gone through my tired of a pie chart i think they're pretty bad i think they still have a like one very specific use case so it's going to be obviously below the donut chart because whenever you think even if you want to do a pie chart for its use case a donut chart will be better but i still think it's a little bit better than the 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 circular bar chart just because like this could be a pie chart and look a little bit better but realistically they should all be, be bar charts okay so this chart right here i i didn't really see it or maybe maybe i did see it uh no so this is like a pairwise chart uh which basically shows all the uh, pairwise interactions and distributions uh you can see it in GG Ally um, pretty well. So let me see if you have a little article. So GG Pairs. Uh, for me, I love GG Pairs. I think generally when I'm working with a lot of columns and you kind of are frozen or you have so many so many features that you want to look at and understand the relationships, but you don't really know where to start, right? You know, you don't know if you want to like, oh, maybe I should plot out the distribution of this this column or maybe I should see the, uh, the uh, scatter plot of this column uh, between these two things. Uh, I think GG Ally is basically the thing you should be doing because you, you get a high level summary of all the relationships, all the distributions between like you, between your columns, you're able to, you know, color it and, and look at all the stuff. So basically this is like a, like one brief EDA in one plot. Um, it does take a while, but it's, it's definitely worth doing and it, and it really, um, alleviates all the manual plotting work you actually have to do. So I consider it S tier. It's not better than the line chart or the uh, the scatter plot because those charts basically make up the pairwise plot, but it's still pretty good. Um, I don't know why I have two of these. I think I'm just gonna put them right next to each other because uh, I think these are the same thing. Yeah, they look like the same thing. Okay, um, area charts. So I think, I, I, in general, I think area charts are kind of interesting uh, when area charts like this one right here, I, I, I'm not really a huge fan of it right here, unless if it's, it's obviously if you're doing like a, a density, um, but I think this is mostly just like a long chart with area. It's not necessarily a density plot. So for that, I, I still think it's pretty good. What I will say is like when you have it kind of crossing the axis like this, I think these charts are very useful. Um, and a line chart won't really capture this kind of uh, of relationship where you can kind of see the actual periods of like a positive value and periods of a negative value. It's much easier to look at it with an area chart than it is with a line chart. So I still really like them. I don't see them a lot, but just because I don't see them a lot doesn't mean that they're not useful. Um, so I'm going to put it, maybe I'll put it right there. Okay. Um, so this is right here, like a hex map. And I really like uh, hex maps. So let me uh, grab that. And hex bin map kind of solves a lot of geospatial problems. So a lot of times when you're visualizing data on a geospatial or like, you know, just anything to do with like uh, locations, a lot of times you see a relationship that's basically tied towards population or, or area and stuff like that. So a good, uh, I think that, these uh, hex bin maps solve is that they basically can uh, uh, convert all of the little states or, or regions that you want to do into a the same area or same size of, of, of a point. So this makes it so you can kind of look at it and not be, I guess, uh, skewed towards larger area, um, uh, larger areas, right? So with, with Texas, Texas is a huge state, it's in California, but once we normalize it to these hex, uh, hexagons, and then we normalize it by population, we get a clear picture of what we want to look at, like say marriage rates. So I'm a huge fan of uh, these hex bin plots. I actually started off my data visualization journey creating hex plots for Iowa counties. Uh, so I, they always have a, 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 you know, a place in my heart. So I guess the big issue with a lot of these hex plots is that 
there is not a lot of hex plots uh, available. And obviously there's probably a plot, there's probably some type of uh, 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 library that can kind of like condense it, uh, sort of, but you know, a lot of these state ones, uh, or like county things, you kind of have to make it yourself by hand and that takes a long time. Uh, so if you have, if you find a play, a hex map that meets your, you know, your, your data that you need, need it for, then it's extremely useful, but sometimes you just don't have it. Uh, and that can be a problem. So I'm going to put it right there and I'll put it probably below just cause you don't see them too often. And a lot of times you won't have the ability to do a hex map, but when you can, they're very nice. Um, they're very nice to have. So, so the next one is like a network plot, I believe. Um, let me see if I, yep, we have a network plot. Um, so yeah, networks, I think they're very cool. They're very interesting. Uh, and there's a lot of data visualization theory that goes into network plots. So, you know, when you're plotting on a network, where should A be relative to B? or where should E be relative to C, you know? So unless if you have specific coordinates, you know, if you're working with like, for me, transportation, where we have these coordinates, it's kind of hard to determine that. And sometimes they'll just do it randomly uh, like that. Sometimes they'll make it a circle. Um, and sometimes they, there's different algorithms that'll do it. So there's a lot of data theory, data visualization, visualization, data visualization theory that goes into network plots. Uh, I th find them very useful in my, in my work. Uh, so it's definitely a thing that you should always have conscious in your brain uh, when you're when you're uh, learning data science, but you don't see them too often, but they are very useful and there's a lot of theory that goes into it. So I'm actually gonna put it pretty high, just above the, uh, eh, probably below it, uh, the heat map. So they're very cool plots. ggplot doesn't have a great support for network plots, but iGraph does. So if you ever need to do a lot of network analysis, um, going into the iGraph library, which I believe is like a subset or a, you know, adjacent ggplot library. Okay. So the next one is the Sankey, Sankey plot. Uh, I find Sankey plots to be very cool, but you don't use them a lot. <laughs> uh, I think if you're doing a lot of like network, like process analysis, uh, then a, a Sankey plot would be very useful. So maybe for like more managers and, and stuff like that, or just in general, anything that has to do with like a process, uh, Sankey plots are pretty useful. Um, you see it a lot with like, you know, your salary and where it goes to and stuff like that. You see it a lot on like r slash data is beautiful. That being said, I don't do a lot with these Sankey plots. I don't even know how to make one in, uh, in R. So although I think it's good, I, I don't use them a lot and I don't find it to be that, uh, I don't, I don't, I guess I don't find it to be useful in my own work. I can see how it could be very useful for a very specific task. Um, so I think I'm gonna put this maybe below the 3D plot. On, honestly, I might switch. I'm gonna switch these out right there because I think the the more I think about it, the more I think about how the Raider and Spider plot is gonna be used a little bit more in a data science workflow than like a Sankey plot. Okay, so this next plot I believe is called like a was it a parallel? plot or something like that. Yeah. A parallel plot. I actually, and parallel plot is basically like a line chart, but you have on your X axis, like categorical variables. Um, I find parallel plots to be actually pretty useful, uh, when trying to visualize distributions, uh, among many samples characteristics. So right here, they're showing it off of like a, uh, was it the iris data set? And you can kind of see how each line represents a sample and the Y axis represents that features value for that sample. And you can kind of see the variation among samples and also the variation among species, right? So I actually find these plots to be very useful. And I think honestly underutilized, um, a lot in a data science workflow. So these plots are very, I think they're very nice, especially with like a, uh, if you're doing like a Bayesian analysis, these are plots are pretty useful to look at since you're always trying to look at like, you know, um, the variance of, of a, of a, of a class or a group. So I actually really like these plots. I do make them probably like once a month uh, when I'm doing an EDA. So it's definitely something that you should consider adding to your toolbox to use. So I, I would actually consider this on the top of uh, a B tier. Um, the next one is maybe like a, what's called like a, um, uh, what's it called? A dense, yeah, density 2D plot. So density 2D plots, 
again, I think they're pretty cool. I, I think they're, you, they're basically this, they're, they are basically the same thing as a, his, as a, a heat map, but it has more to do with actual areas. So like if you're doing a lot of geospatial stuff, it's pretty useful. So for me, I, I still think it's, it's good. That being said, I, I definitely have a preference towards uh, heat maps in general, just cause the binning is kind of weird in ggplot. And a lot of the stuff is kind of weird, but we can see how there's a lot of variations uh, with the uh, hex, was it the dense 2D density plots? Um, and you can, you definitely get an insight. So like what's going on in that hotspot or, you know, stuff like that. Uh, I, I don't like contour plots as much with these lines, uh, even though like, I think most data scientists and analysts can read it. I, I think I would be hesitant to show it in a in a presentation because a lot of times people will misread a contour plot and it's better to just have like, you know, the brighter the color, the the more the value instead of like, oh, the closer the lines, the, the more the value is, is increased. Um, so yeah, not a fan of uh, contour plots. So the next is, what is it? A, uh, uh, was that Quello? Qu uh, Coral? Choropleth, yeah, choropleth. So again, if you're doing a lot of plotting and uh, geospatial stuff, you're gonna do this. Um, generally, I think I would just call this like a plot of a map and stuff like that. But one of the main problems that you face with these uh, choropleth plots is that when you have these colors, you can see like your eye kind of darts towards the larger um, countries and not really the actual colors of it. So it can kind of do a lot of mislead. It can kind of mislead you on it. Right. Which is why we have, you know, the, uh, the hex hex maps and stuff like that. So I think they, again, they, they are useful. I, I'm not saying they're not useful, but I would always try to prefer a, 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 a hex bin plot. So now we're actually at the kind of the NLP stuff, which is the word cloud. Um, and for me, uh, my friends actually know my reputation on, um, word clouds. And the thing is, I, I really hate word clouds. I think word clouds are just terrible. I, I think they're kind of weird and I think that they don't display a good use of data visualizations. And what I mean by that is one right here, there's way too many colors. The colors don't obviously mean anything. It's just to separate and distinguish the words, but the size of the words is very hard to distinguish, right? So oil, I guess is the biggest word, but a lot of the times the size is also dictated by, you know, the amount of letters a word has, which makes it very hard to compare, you know, tokens with each other. So maybe it's, it's cool for maybe a design standpoint, if you're trying to make a, some artwork, but for me, from a, a data, data visualization point, it's, it's just terrible. Uh, it, I would rather have a column chart that is representative of, of that word, right? And then maybe have some type of like lumped other column. So yeah, not a fan of word clouds. I think they could be interesting if you want to do like maybe a, a dashboard or something like that, or just kind of something for someone to kind of browse. But for actual insight, it's not good. Um, I would actually consider it maybe on the tier of like a, a, a pie chart. So this plot right here, I believe is like, uh, kind of like a network thing with, uh, a connection plot, um, a connection map. I think this is super niche, uh, it's basically the same thing as a network plot, but you know, again, used with maps, I think it's a fine plot, maybe a little bit above the hierarchy plots or whatever, but you're not going to use it every day. It's something if, unless if you're in like transportation, you'll use. Uh, so I don't really have much to say about that. Okay. So this plot right here, I think it's called like a, a joy plot or, or a ridgeline plot, which is basically based off the, uh, joy division album. So, um, these plots are getting more common now in, uh, in, in data science, right? So it's a unknown pleasures album. Um, I am a huge fan of a ridgeline chart because a lot of times you're trying to compare distributions of some type of parameter or some type of value among multiple groups. And although, you know, ggplot has a thing where you have the colors and you can, uh, you can decrease the alpha, having it as different lines makes it way easier to compare values. Um, I'm a huge fan of it. 
I think it's honestly one of the better S tier plots that I use most most of the time. So if you're doing Bayesian analysis, ridge ridge uh, ridgeline plots are extremely useful. If you just want to compare distributions among groups or among multiple columns, uh, again, ridgeline plots are are great. So I believe this is a was it a uh, a density plot, right? Let me see. Yep, a density plot. Oh, do I not have a history? Oh no, I do. Uh, I like density plots a lot. Um, so right here, this is a time where, you know, you don't really need a, a ridgeline plot, but right here, yeah, a ridgeline plot would be pretty, pretty useful because it's kind of hard to compare these things. They're just kind of stacked together or we can facet it like that. But I, I really like, um, density plots. If you have, uh, things like this, this is a time when ridgeline plots won't really make any sense. So a mirrored density plot is pretty cool. Um, yeah, in general, I like densities. Um, sometimes I do prefer some binning just to remove the tail ends, but I do enjoy a density plot. So I'm going to compare it to pretty top of A tier. Um, and then the histogram right here, uh, histograms again, very similar to a density plot, but we have some binning. Uh, I, I enjoy a, a good histogram. I don't like these histograms where you can't see any distinguish of the bins. So like I generally say a like color equals white. Uh, so we have like kind of like this style, but in general, I, I, I do enjoy, uh, using, I do like, uh, uh, histograms in general. Sometimes I, I prefer not to have any actual bins and I'll just do a simple bar chart. But when you're doing bar charts and histograms, they're, they're relatively similar, except histograms are, are binning it in, in groups. So, uh, I, I definitely consider it to be more at least top of, uh, the density plot, I think. For me personally, I use density plots a little bit more than histograms, but I, th I know a lot of other people will use histograms for density plots. So, uh, nothing much to say. Um, what is, I'm, I'm curious what this is. Oh, yep. This is a bubble plot. So bubble plots are just scatter plots where the size of the point is increased. And I'm pretty against bubble plots, uh, or I'm, I'm in general, I'm against changing the size um, as a, a variable because it's kind of hard to compare two circles, uh, for values, uh, because a circle twice the size of, as another circle doesn't really look exactly twice. Cause you have like radiuses and stuff like that. Um, so if you are using bubble charts, it's more of just kind of a general trend not to have a direct comparison. Right. So it's like, oh, these two, these, these two bubbles right here are larger than the other ones. What are those bubbles? But if we want to compare like how much bigger is, you know, that bubble compared to this bubble, it's not a great uh, thing to do, but again, they're very common. Uh, they just can't be misused in, in the wrong manner, which you can say about any plot. But I think these plots are very easy to mis uh, misuse and misinterpret where you can kind of, um, where it's harder to compare direct, uh, direct samples together. Okay. So this plot right here, I'm, uh, I'm actually not sure what this is. Oh, an arc diagram. That's what it's called. Um, uh, nah, I, I think these plots are kind of pretty, not very hard to figure out what's going on. <laughs> uh, I, if, I guess it's supposed to be like a network plot where you can see how like a is being, has a relationship with all these and you can see how B has a relationship with a and E. I think that's cool. Um, maybe but again this this plot is harder to understand compared to this plot uh so i don't really think i think again it's more the style over substance stuff i'm gonna put it right there it's still better than you know a donut chart no nah, actually it probably isn't now i'm gonna put it below uh below that it's not as bad as this circular bar chart but it's pretty bad i i think it's 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 almost like a pretentious <laughs> like a data visualization where i think it's not a good way to in, uh, analyze data. Okay. Um, what, what is this? Um, oh, yep. This is a hierarchical edge, edge bundling plot. Um, I think this is pretty interesting. I think again, it's pretty much a variation of, uh, of the, uh, of the cord cordogram. I think this is a little bit cleaner just to see like, oh, we have a little groups. So 
I'll put it above right here. But again, I don't think maybe I guess these are pretty similar. So I don't know why they would be this one is better than that one. Actually, it might switch them where uh, oops, where this is a little bit better than that plot. But again, uh, I'm not really a big fan of them. I don't really use them too often too. So uh, maybe I'm just missing something. So the next one, second to last one is the violin plot. Uh, I think violin plots are really cool because violin plots are essentially density plots flipped on its side and mirrored. And one of the big criticisms of a density plot is that the mirroring effect kind of is confusing. Additionally, it's it's pretty hard to read for someone who's not really familiar with the density plot. But I like density plot. I I like the violin plots because it shows a little bit more detail of a GD plot uh, of a box plot while still maintaining a lot of the clarity of a box plot. That being said, um, one of the biggest criticisms is if you need more detail on a box plot, just plot like a GG ridge, a, a ridge line plot, right, from, from there. And I kind of agree with them. Uh, I kind of think that violin plots were a hot trend for a year, and then people realized that there's alternatives to it. But I, I still enjoy seeing a violin plot every now and then. I just don't use them anymore. Uh, I, I definitely switch more towards ridgeline plots. So I'm probably going to put them up to C. I think they're above a Sankey gram because you'll probably see a violin plot more often than a Sankey plot. But it's not, not the best plot now, now that there's more modern alternatives. So lastly, we have the box plot. Um, box plot shows the quartiles, or the, and then you can also see the mean, median, and outliers. I love box plots. I... It's probably one of my favorite plots to look at. And there's a lot of use cases with them, right? You can compare groups and their distributions. You can also see like, oh, what, between two groups, which one has like the higher me median. Um, that's very useful. Additionally, what you can do is add in your GM points or your, so you can kind of make almost like a, a scatter plot or whatever. Um, and I think instead of having a violin plot, it's actually nicer to have just a box plot and then you put in GM jitter with uh, a height uh, at zero. So the jitter, the points can only go width-wise and can't go vertically. So that way we can see, you know, the, the summary, statistics, summary, statistics, summary statistics of the outliers, quantiles, median, while also looking where is the distribution of all of our samples. So I love box plots. I think they're incredibly useful and I use them literally every day. So I'm gonna put them right above here. Uh, I'm going to look at these just a little bit more to see if I want to change anything. Um, yeah, so animation chart. I think I'm, maybe I was a little too too cruel on the animation chart. Um, I think this chart is pretentious, but actually still gives some type of insight, whereas the, the uh, word cloud doesn't. I do think I'm pretty against the uh, circular bar chart, and obviously we're going to put uh, the pie chart uh, below. Actually, just because the... Just a, because it's data visualization, I'm going to put the pie chart all the way on the bottom. Um, as for S tier, I think bar charts are the best. Scatter plots are definitely good. Line charts right here are very good. The ridge line plot is it's extremely useful. The box plot is extremely useful. The pairwise plot is the thing that I, I usually do a lot when I start my EDAs. Density and histograms are are very good. I kind of yeah, no, I, I I definitely use ridgeline plots more than these guys, and I use box plots more than the uh, histogram stuff like that. I think lollipop charts are again pretty good too. Networks are good, area stuff like that. I think one thing I, I'm thinking about seeing right here is a lot of these plots that I think are lower rated have to do with a lot of like relationships and processes. Um, and for me, I just don't do a lot of that stuff. So I'm sure if we have someone who watching this video does a lot of like network analysis, they might disagree with me, but I think for a beginner, you're not going to see that a lot. Um, so yeah, um, here's my t final tier list. I'll probably I'll post the link to your, towards the uh, towards the tier maker uh, website so you can make your own tier list. And uh, yeah, I'll see you guys next time and uh, tidy on.